Welcome back to the Realm of History, special edition today as we celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, one of the things that I try to do is pick that quote that I just had in the intro that uh, Dr. King stated about the oppressed versus the oppressors. And it relates really well to what we're learning about in chapter 20, uh, because as you could tell from the reading and from the lessons that we looked at, um, you know, this chapter talked about the enslavement of Native Americans, the mistreatment of Native Americans, the genocide that was practiced against Native Americans, the oppressors being the Europeans in this case, the oppressed being Native peoples, uh, the oppressors being the Europeans, the oppressed being African peoples. We talked about the Atlantic slave trade. We talked about the Middle Passage. We talked about plantations and encomienda systems that were uh, put in place by the Spanish and Portuguese early on in the 15 and 1600s. Uh, so the civil rights movement was where uh, people started to utilize those voices and start to break away from some of those oppressors, but it took a long time. Uh, that's what we're trying to build in with our look at history here today. All right, a lot to go over with you here on chapter 20. So I want to make sure that I get through some of the things that I have planned for you. And uh, then, of course, open up for questions later on. Uh, but this is the agenda that I'm looking at. We'll go through some key advice here at the beginning. We'll go through quite a few of the key terms, the figures, the places. I will be talking about some things that you really need to know. We'll have some short answer talk, a little bit of AP advice and preparation. Of course, we'll get into our question and answer session. And then, of course, I will stop with some final pieces of advice toward the end. Uh, let's get right into the key advice today. Uh, my key advice for you tonight is, of course, to really write things down. You know, I'm not sure how you go about these review sessions, but I really want to encourage you to write things down from this session. There's going to be a lot of important material that I'm going to share with you, a lot of clues and hints, you know, because we missed our review day. Uh, so I'm trying to I'm going to try to be as thorough as possible and as helpful as possible with you here tonight. Uh, number two, as always, pray for the right things. Uh, right now, you know, I've I've received probably six, five or six messages already from your classmates that they are not going to be here this week due to uh, being ill. Um, I think you understand that we're still in the pandemic, so you know they are uh, they are going to be out, and uh, I want to pray for them. I want to make sure that we keep anybody who is struggling right now in our prayers, um, and then of course for your family. Pray for your family's health and safety. Pray for your health and safety. Uh, pray for the good Lord to guide you to use those talents that you've been blessed with to the fullest. And of course, pray the prayer of gratitude, thanking the good Lord for all of the blessings that he's bestowed upon you. Now, we are really so fortunate. I'm so fortunate to be able to be here with you tonight and every day in class. I really, really appreciate all of you and uh, just love what I do. Okay, next, I want you to be here now. Starting right now, I want you to focus in for this quiz tomorrow. Okay, it's an important one. Uh, last week, some of you had a little bit of a shaky start to the semester. So you want to get back on track here by being here now, focusing on, of course, the task at hand. Make sure that you're popping in history when you need to pop that in. And right now is a good time to do that. Okay. Uh, number four, say thank you to your parents. You know, they do so many things for you. Uh, I, I know that we had so many sporting events going on. I heard that some of the sporting events out of state. Um, across the country, you know, the parents play a big role in that. So make sure that you're thanking your parents uh, when you get the chance. I would do that tonight uh, before you go to sleep. Make sure you say thank you to those wonderful parents. Um, and then, of course, number five, rise to the challenge, right? Meet the challenge. Tomorrow is going to be a challenge. It always is going to be a challenge. You got to make sure that you're ready. Not trying to make it easy on you, especially on the AP part. The AP part is going to be a challenge. You got to be ready. We talked about that. Okay. Next, I want to get into, of course, the key terms with you. There aren't that many on the sheet, uh, so I think it would be nice and feasible to go through these fairly quickly, starting with joint stock company. Okay, we talked about this one on Friday in our online lesson. Remember, a joint stock company works kind of like a modern-day corporation where people invest in the company by buying shares of stock or putting in a percentage of money. Most of the old school joint stock companies in the 1500s and the 1600s, which is the time period in which we're learning about, merchants were investing their money in overseas trade. What they wanted to do is they wanted to have a ship captain who was going to go to the new world. And when they got to the new world, they're looking for gold or silver or some type of cash crop that they can grow. Okay, So people would put in money and invest in that. And whatever a percentage of money they put into the expedition, 
they got that much of the profit. So that's how a joint stock company works. Remember, it's most aligned with exploration and adventures. Okay, that's really what it was looking into at the time in which we are learning. Okay, next. This one is probably one that you, you have a, a big question about. This came from section three, which you did the outline on. Okay, this was from the section on the Atlantic slave trade. And that, that section in the book talked about there were really two different types of slavery that were talked about. One was slavery that was happening within Africa, which was mostly propagated by the Muslim population. Okay. The Arabic Muslims were the first to enslave Africans. All right. And they enslaved quite a few African civilizations. The thing about this is that you have to understand their method of slavery was different than the American system. Okay. When I say American system, I'm talking about the system employed by the Spanish, the English, uh, somewhat the French, okay, the Portuguese. There's the difference right there, okay. In the Muslim system, you had a little bit more what we call social mobility, meaning you had a few more freedoms. You could work your way out of a state of slavery, okay, within the African or Muslim system. And it was not hereditary. Just because you were a slave, didn't mean that your children were going to be a slaves. We're going to be slaves. That is not the case in the American system. The American system is much more harsh. It is hereditary. Your children will be slaves. And there's very limited social mobility. There are only a few instances that I've read about in historic documents where slaves have actually been granted their freedom uh, by an oppressor. Okay. So that's what you really have to understand that the American system of slavery, which was propagated first in the United States by the English, okay, was a much more harsh system. Let's break it down though. Uh, let's not forget any state of slavery is wrong, right? So yes, there's layers here, uh, but slavery is slavery, okay? You are owned by another human being and you are a human being. And so that is what makes it inherently wrong. And we have to understand that too. Okay, next, uh, related to that is the encomienda system. The encomienda system is something deployed by the Spanish in both Mexico and South America. The encomienda system is a forced labor system. What they would do is they would create large farms or plantations. They would take native peoples and force them to work on that land. They were supposed to take care of the native peoples, but they really didn't. Uh, they did not pay them uh, and they were treated very much like slaves. So it's a forced labor system that created a cheap labor source for Spanish farmers and plantation owners trying to make money off of cash crops like tobacco, uh, sugar, uh, cotton, so on and so forth. Next is global trade. When we take a look at global trade, it's a pretty blanketed statement, right? Um, it really just refers to the time period here, late 1400s, 1500s, 1600s, where exploration was starting to expand. We learned about the new types of ships that were developed. We learned about the new technology like the compass and the astrolabe. Those different types of technological advancements allowed for sailors and explorers from different countries to get to India, to get to China, to eventually get to the Americas. And so that opened up many new products like we learned about in the Columbian Exchange, which allowed for globalized trade, a globalized economy where now by shipping, you could get items from across the world in, you know, a matter of months. It would take a long time, but you could trade for those items due to this expanse of exploration. That's the gist of global trade. It's something that's still going on today. It's called the global economy. This was started here with the, the adventures of Vasco da Gama, Christopher Columbus, Ferdinand Magellan, so on and so forth. Okay, moving on down the list. This is a really important one, the Colombian Exchange. We also learned about this one on Friday, okay? We learned about this one on Friday. And it's important to take note that the Colombian Exchange, there's a major chart on page 572. And that chart talks about all the items that went from Europe and Africa and Asia to the Americas, and then all the different items that went from the Americas, okay, of course, to Europe, Africa, Asia, the rest of the world. You're going to need to know those items, but some of the big picture things, like if you wanted to break it down into a working definition, 
you could say that the Colombian exchange was the, the trade of plants, animals, goods, and diseases, right? Plants, animals, goods, diseases, etc., cetera, uh, from the old world or Europe to the new world or the Americas. That's really the trade-off there if you wanted that working definition. But studying the chart on 572, which we will go over here in a second, um, in, well, not in a second, but in several minutes, we'll go over and I'll show you that chart on the screen here toward the end. Okay, next, mercantilism. Mercantilism is a theory. It's an economic system where countries would believe that their power depended on their wealth. So the more wealth or gold that they could acquire, the better off they would be. That's mercantilism. The way that they did this was by going out and exploiting colonies. All right, they take over places in Africa. They take over places in the Americas. They take over islands in Asia, right? And they, they pretty much use the people there as slaves, and they exploit them for the resources. They basically take all of their resources and then sell it. They wanted to export more than the import to create that favorable balance of trade. Um, so mercantilism, the premise is good, but the way you, you go about gaining the wealth is bad because you exploit people. And that's really one of the big um, system flaws. However, countries that were using mercantilism were very powerful. Spain, for example, used a mercantilist um, economic policy. A lot of people ask, you know, when we get later in the year, why are some countries, you know, not as, not as advanced as others? A lot of the countries, like in Africa, South America, okay, some countries in Asia, all their resources, all their best people were used by European countries, the Portuguese, the Spanish. They took all the resources. So, takes forever to rebuild. Okay, a lot of these, what we say, third world countries are still re rebuilding from this time period in history. So that sets them back. You have to really understand that historically. Okay, next, we'll talk about the Atlantic slave trade. This is from the section three. Basically, there was a big trade-off going on here with three continents. You have Africa, you have Europe, and then let's lump the Americas, really four continents, but Let's lump the Americas into one entity here, okay? What was happening is you have guns and gold being traded from Europeans to Africans. And the Africans that were being bought by that guns and gold were sent on ships over the Middle Passage to the Americas where they would be enslaved and forced to work on plantations. What was produced in the Americas was called raw materials, raw cotton, raw tobacco, uh, raw timber, whatever it may be, okay, raw sugar. Those are raw materials. They were being sent from the Americas back to Europe. Europe was taking the raw materials like the cotton, turning it into T-shirts, clothing, cloth, what have you, sending it back to the Americas to be bought and sold by people populating that land. So Europe is dominating the Atlantic slave trade and getting very wealthy off of it by using African peoples and also by inadvertently using early American settlers because what they were doing is they were taking their raw materials holding a monopoly over it, and then selling the raw materials at a, as a manufactured good back to the Americans, okay, the patriots. This is one of the reasons that led into the American Revolution because, see, the patriots, the American um, settlers, the early on uh, folks here in the 13 colonies, they couldn't make T-shirts. The British made laws where, you know, you couldn't produce these goods that we're producing. We... Are controlling that so if you want to buy the goods you got to buy them from us that was one of the factors for separating we'll get to that in the next chapter actually that's going to be coming your way in the next chapter okay next the triangular trade system now for this one i am going to share with you and i hope that you can see if you came to my session at 11:05 on friday i had that extra session I showed this to students, but when I show it today, you need to copy it down because we had we had cut time in class because there was online Friday, right? So normally I always draw this on the board and I talk you through this. We weren't able to do that. I had to do it online. So I'm going to show it to you all now. Make sure that you're ready to copy this down, okay? All right, it's going to take me just one second. 
I will pull it up. Okay, here we go. This, what you should be able to see on the screen right now, is what I'm wanting you to basically copy. Okay, uh, what it is, you have the Americas. I drew that like a rectangle with a triangle at the bottom. You have Europe, which I drew as a rectangle. And then you have Africa, which I drew as a large triangle here. You need to label this properly. Make sure that you draw it. I'm not the best artist, okay? And if you can't see this, that's okay. Let me talk you through it. I am going to show you where you can find it. It is posted in the weekly agenda on the bulletin board, okay? So you'll be able to, to grab this and you can have it for yourself. But basically, Europe is sending guns and gold to Africa. Africa is sending slaves across the Middle Passage, that very treacherous journey to the Americas. Like I just said in the previous, raw materials are being produced in the Americas like cotton sent back to Europe. And then from Europe, manufactured goods are being sent back to the Americas. So this is what I just told you about in the Atlantic slave trade is basically what you need to know for the triangular trade system. However, you're going to need to write this, draw this, label this, on your quiz paper tomorrow. So I would strongly urge you to go here. I'm going to show you now. Go to the grade book. Okay. And when you go to the grade book, like let's say second hour, if I wanted to go to second hour, I pick second hour. And then what you do is you see the weekly agenda. There's week three. That's this week coming up. What you want to do is go to the week two one. When you click the week two, you can scroll it down and I can show you right here it says triangular trade system drawing when you click on that link it is going to take you to that drawing that i just went through if you missed the review sheet for any reason i've got that linked for you also the slideshow that i had on teams meeting on friday is here available for you so you'll be able to grab any of those things if you can't see it on my screen tonight you will be able to get to them okay so it's there for you and um I hope that you will be able to utilize that information. Okay, we're going to come back to the normal screen now. I'm not sure. It looked a little bit small for me. It may have been small for you, uh, but I've got you covered. Um, you can get that those links on the bulletin board. All you have to do is go there and, uh, and grab them, okay? All right, next, we're moving into disease forms. All you need to do is look for the page 572. There's going to be a chart there. It's going to have a list of diseases starting with smallpox. Smallpox is the big one that was transferred from Europe to the Americas. There weren't very many diseases that Europeans got from native peoples. The reason why is because of a lack of domesticable species, okay, and also something called population density, okay. People in Europe lived in a very, very dense populated area, people living pretty much right on top of each other. We learned about this in the Middle Ages, pretty gross. They didn't have very good hygiene, right? Didn't bathe very much. Uh, so those diseases spread really quickly, and, and then they developed immunities to those diseases. When they come to the new world, okay, you have to understand that most human diseases are passed to us from animals. So people who have contact with a lot of animals, like Europeans and Africans and Asians, those different groups have domesticable species. The problem for the natives is that the only domesticable species really available was the dog and the turkey, you know, but they don't really give us that many diseases. So really, there weren't that many diseases spread from the native population to the Europeans. And, and that's one of the big reasons. It's about domesticable species. OK, those forms you can find on 572. Next, inflation. Pretty simple, but. All the gold and silver that was being transferred from the Americas to Spain, the Americas to England, that caused inflation. Remember, money is only valuable because it is rare. Currency is only valuable because it is rare. If you could find diamonds everywhere, women wouldn't want them for engagement rings. Okay, If you could go in your backyard and get a diamond, they're not valuable, right? What makes diamonds valuable is that they are rare, okay? So you have to understand that once gold and silver becomes less rare, it becomes less valuable. And most countries use gold and silver as their currency, so this causes inflation. Inflation is where there is a decrease in the value of said money. 
and also an increase in the price of goods. That's what inflation is. Next, the Treaty of Tordesillas. We talked about this one in class, but I want to remind you. Treaty of Tordesillas is where Pope, Pope Alexander VI, steps in to solve a conflict between two Catholic countries, Spain and Portugal, right? He says, all right, you guys are competing for all of these different lands and exploring, and hey, I don't want you guys to go to war, okay? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to create an imaginary dividing line called the line of demarcation, which is technically about 60 degrees west longitude. It kind of cuts halfway through Brazil, all right? There's a map that we went through on the book. We talked about this. But anything west of that line, which is also my next uh, term here, line of demarcation. Anything west of that line went to Spain. Anything east of that line was granted to Portugal by the Pope. So Treaty of Tordesillas and line of demarcation kind of go hand in hand. Treaty of Tordesillas was put in play in 1493, and it basically created a, div a divider between what lands Spain could grab and what lands Portugal could grab. Spain got Mexico, Peru, Florida, Texas. Portugal got half of Brazil, and then all of the east coast of Africa, which they had already established their trading lines there. Okay. We made it through quite a bit of information. I'm going to still be going here. Uh, next, I do want to talk about, okay, I, I don't have it on my uh, on my sheet, on my um, banners, you know, my little things that I can pull up there. But I want to talk about how the key figures play in here. Okay, let's talk about... I'm going to go really fast through the key figures and tell you, hey, what do you, what do you really need to know about these key figures? First off on your sheet, if you're following along with me on your sheet, is Vasco da Gama. Vasco da Gama is a Portuguese sailor. He creates a direct route to India, right? That's the most important because of the spice trade, direct route to India. And hopefully you're writing this down. I'm going to go fast. This will replay so you can catch it maybe tomorrow morning, whatnot. Ferdinand Magellan. He was a sailor. He sailed for Portugal. He and his crew, he and his crew, okay, circumnavigate the globe. Because remember, I taught you in class that Magellan actually was killed by local natives in the Philippines. So he didn't actually make it all the way, uh, but his crew did circumnavigate the globe. That means they sailed all the way around the world. Next is Christopher Columbus. I don't know if I really need to talk too much, but I want to tell you that he sailed for Spain. A lot of these explorers, uh, they weren't from the countries that they sailed for. They were like free agents. I mean, they were going to go to whoever gave them the best deal, the most money, whatever joint stock company would fund their expedition. So the only queen and king that, that Columbus could get was Ferdinand and, and uh, Isabella. They, they funded his voyages, and it worked out really well for them because they got really wealthy off of it. Next is uh, Francisco Pizarro on your sheet. What you need to know about Pizarro, he's the Spanish conquistador that conquered the Inca in 1531, okay? Prior to Pizarro, though, there was Hernan Cortez. Hernan Cortez was the Spanish conquistador that conquered the Aztec. So once again, Pizarro conquers the Inca, Cortez conquers the Aztec, okay? You have... Montezuma, we've already learned about Montezuma, but what's important for this chapter is that Montezuma was the Aztec ruler when they were conquered by Cortes. All right. And the next term is Atahualpa. Once again, we already learned about Atahualpa, but for this chapter, Atahualpa was the emperor of the Inca when they were conquered by Pizarro. Okay. So you can kind of connect Pizarro and Atahualpa, and you can connect Cortes and Montezuma. Metacom, also known as King Philip, is next on your sheet. In 1675, he led a revolt or an uprising against the English. Lasted about a year. He had some success, but eventually the English defeated his uprising. They called him King Philip because he looked like the Spanish king at the time, who was named actually Philip. Okay, Amerigo Vespucci. The Americas are named after Amerigo Vespucci, okay? One of the big reasons is because he drew a lot of maps and estimated the coastline of both South and North America, okay? So the Americas are named after Vespucci. Why aren't they named after Columbus, right? 
he was the first, uh, well, he was really the second, we believe, European explorer to be here. Leif Erikson most likely did create a route to northern Canada. Um, but Columbus being there, we know for a fact. Why didn't they name the Americas after Columbus? Why isn't it all Columbia? Well, remember, Columbus thought he was in Asia. He literally thought he was in India. He called the people Los Indios, which was a terrible misnomer. So he, he thought he was in Asia. Americo Vespucci made no prediction like that. He said, nope, this is an entirely new continent here. And he was right. Columbus was wrong. So that's one of the big reasons why we credit uh, Americo Vespucci with naming or granting the name of the Americas. Okay, Henry Hudson is the last key figure on your sheet. Henry Hudson was a Dutch explorer. Well, he sailed for the Dutch, okay? And he was searching for what's called the Northwest Passage. He was trying to find a route up northern Canada to get to Asia, to the Pacific, uh, but everything up there is frozen. So he ended up kind of founding some areas like Hudson Bay, Hudson Strait, Hudson River, and laying stake in those areas for the Dutch Netherlands. No, I'm going fast. Just trying to give you a little bit of enlightenment here on what you need to know about those key figures. It's pretty basic, okay? There will be a matching section on the quiz, which we'll talk about uh, those figures indeed. Okay, next, I'm going to highlight a couple of key places now. The key places are on your sheet. It's not part of your assignment. Remember, the assignment is to do the key terms and the key figures, which I just went over all of them for you. Uh, so you really should, it really shouldn't be very many um, issues there. I just went over them. But, you know, of course, if you have questions, we'll, we'll answer. Now, the key places, I want to highlight France. Like it says France on there. Like if I'm a student, so what am I supposed to do with that? I get you. I feel you. But let me tell you what I'm, what I mean here. When it says France on there, like, for example, what you need to know, okay, the French explorers, right? The French explorers that I had on the board in green, what areas did they control? What did they colonize? Like for the French, they got involved in the fur trade, right? Their big reason for coming to the Americas was the fur trade. So the, the places, it's not just some simple working definition. It's like, where, how are they all connected? Um, the Bahamas, what, what in the world are the Bahamas doing on the sheet? Well, that's the area that Columbus most likely landed in, right? That was in the reading, that was in the lecture notes. So that's something you need to know. The Caribbean. What's important about the Caribbean? Well, the English, the Dutch, and the French were competing to establish colonies there where they placed sugar plantations, cotton plantations, created cash crops, searched for gold, enslaved the natives, eventually brought African slaves over. Uh, so you can see that it's just a quick place on your sheet, but it's involved in so much more. And you need to know how it's involved in that so much more. That's really part of your job as a student. Okay. Next, on to my list here. Let's go to the AP tips and suggestions. I'll also talk about some of the short answer questions here. In my hands, I am holding the actual quiz paper right here, okay? So I'm holding the quiz paper. So this is exactly what I'm going to tell you about the short answer. Uh, from the notes on your review sheet, the first two are definitely on there. Being able to list off items that were going back and forth in the Columbian Exchange is a must. But you need to know what direction they're going, okay? If they're going from the old world, Europe, Africa, Asia, to the Americas, that's going west across the Atlantic Ocean. That's headed west, okay? If it's going from the Americas to the old world, that's going east across the Atlantic, okay? So you need to know the items that were going both ways. You need to be very specific. If I were you, I would study and know six, seven items, okay, each way. Make sure that you don't get them confused either. You really need to make sure that you get that down. You are going to have to draw the triangular trade system that I showed you when I shared my screen. If you didn't grab it there, couldn't see it, you go to the bulletin board and grab it from the weekly agenda. It's in the week two weekly agenda. You scroll down. It'll say triangular trade system. Grab that, redraw it, copy it down. Make sure that you have it, okay? that You're going to have to reproduce that tomorrow. It's also going to count for three points. Whoa, that's a big part of it. All you got to do is draw it and label it properly. If anybody has a question, put it in the question and answer session. 
and I'll do my best to uh, to uh, get get that information to you. Finally, on your notes, okay, it says you must be able to list and explain the seven key factors that led to the Spanish conquest of the Aztec. I had this written on the board, on the left board, right? The board on the left. And I had it in the notes that I handed off to you uh, for the end of section one, okay? So make sure that you know those factors. You're going to have to be able to write them down. You're going to have to be able to list the, the factors. Let me go through them with you right now if you want to write them down right now if you're confused. The number one factor is the Quetzalcoatl theory. This theory that they thought that Cortez and the Spanish may be gods, right? Based on that old prophecy that we learned about in chapter 16. Second, the Spanish, because the Aztec didn't attack them right away because they may have thought they were gods, the Spanish made an alliance with a huge tribe that hate the Aztec. They were called the Tlaxcala. T-L-A-X-C-A-L-A. -A. That brought them about 30,000 men. The Spanish only had 500 guys, all right? Adding in 30,000 against an Aztec military of 1 million, you're still highly outnumbered, but now you got at least a fighting chance, okay? Uh, the third factor is the horse. The Spanish had the horse. The native have never seen a horse. They are deathly afraid of the horse, especially when you put a man on top of it and the man is controlling this large of a beast. That's scary. This is another reason why they thought they were gods initially. Number four, the Spanish had steel weapons and armor. The Aztec are using obsidian blades with wooden baseball bats, basically. Okay, That's a pretty big difference. Now, you might say, well, the Spanish had guns. Yeah, they had old school muskets. Not very accurate. Took about two minutes to reload. Reload, okay, so... They only had about 20 of them anyway, and that really didn't make that much of a difference. Crossbows now? Crossbows might be a different story. They had about 50 crossbows. That may have been a big, big difference maker. Number five is a woman, key female named La Malinche, who was a translator. She was able to translate the language barrier uh, between the two groups, okay? And so there were other people involved, uh, but nonetheless, knowing that La Malinche was a translator and was able to communicate with both the Aztec and the Spanish was where the deals were made, right? Was where the diplomacy was going on. So this was a big deal. Number six, battle tactics. If you remember, I taught you that Aztec battle tactics are to capture the enemy. They want to capture you so they can sacrifice you to the gods, right? What greater sacrificial victim than a strong Spanish warrior with armor that can control a horse, right? So in the first battles, they're really trying to capture the Spanish. But when you bonk on the head, a guy who's wearing a steel helmet doesn't do very much. Uh, so the problem is they have to eventually change their tactics to try and kill their opponent. And by then it may have been too late. You know, it may have been too late. They won a lot of battles against the Spanish, by the way, uh, even with these poor battle tactics. The organization on the battlefield also went to the advantage of Spain as well. And the final overarching factor, th these seven factors are what I wrote my master's thesis on. It was a 43-page document. The only one that I really needed to write about was disease because disease kills 90, possibly 95% of all Aztec people in the long run. So that was one of the biggest factors that we could ever look at there. Okay, also in my hands, I hold the AP, okay? I hold the AP version or portion of the test. I'm going to give you some pointers here. The MCQ, the multiple choice question, and the SAQ, which will have prompts that you're going to have to answer. Listen to me carefully. I've taken them directly out of your book. Not going to tell you what page. Not going to tell you which end of the topic. Like there's topic 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, 3.4. The two questions, the MCQ has three questions. I took it directly out of the end of topic questions. The SAQ has three parts, okay? I took it directly out of one of the SAQs at the end of those topics, okay? Could be 3.1, could be 3.3, could be 3.2. But I'm, I mean, I don't know what bigger clue I can give you. If you study your textbook, if you look at all the different possible questions, you're gonna know the question. You don't know the answer but you know the question I just told you right now. 
They are taken from within the AMSCO book. I don't know how much more generous I could be on that, but you got to find it. Okay, now I'll be more specific now. I'm going to tell you, here's the things that you really need to study because as I told you, on top of the MCQ and the SAQ question, I am throwing down some of my own short answer, just basic short answer from the reading. I told you, hey, last week, boy, our scores were not very good. We didn't do the reading. Students who did the reading, balled out of control. Students who didn't, you could definitely tell. Had some twos out of tens, some threes out of tens. Well, fours, the average was like five and a half. So, hey, we want to make improvements. It's the same reading. You've had close to three weeks to do it now. So there's really no excuse. All right. Now I'm going to tell you, here's what you need to focus on. Write this down. Number one, you need to know the gunpowder empires. Gunpowder empires. Number two, you need to know the important taxation systems that were mentioned in the reading. Number three, you need to know about how rulers, empires, country civilizations used monumental art and architecture. How did they use it? Why did they use it? What benefit did it give to them? You'll need to know that. And finally, 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 they were numerous. There's a plethora of key figures mentioned in that Unit 3 reading, the AP Unit 3 reading. You need to zero in on about five to seven of them and know them really well. It's your choice who you pick, okay? But you need to, I'm telling you, you need to know about five to seven and you need to know them very well because you're going to have to list their name and you're going to have to talk about them. And the, you're going to have to talk about them. You're going to have to write about them. So I'm telling you, that's what you need to do if you want to score well on the AP. The AP is going to be a challenge. Whoa, it's going to be a challenge. I'm, I made it to be a challenge because, hey, you've had three weeks to read 40 pages. Okay, I think that's enough said. All right. Whew, I've been, it's been 37 minutes I've been talking. I'm fired up. I'm going to still, we're going to stay on here for as long as we need to. I am absolutely fired up and I'm, I'm ready to go. I do need a little bit of a break. Uh, so I created a shorter commercial this week, just representing a little bit. Uh, so I want to share that with you. It's not the same one as last week. It's much shorter and it's uh, kind of my own making here. So hopefully you will enjoy. I'll be back in 30 seconds. All right, so just a brief message from the little ones. Uh, I was up at the realm uh, with Ava, and uh, she helped me staple all the quiz papers today. And then, uh, of course, Ella gave you a little bit of good luck wishes there, too. So hopefully you will do very well tomorrow. Okay, uh, I am ready for question and answer session now. So I am ready for that. I want you to go ahead and ask me any questions that you need answered. I will uh, do my best to uh, make sure that I get those answered for you. Uh, Gannon says, I'm concussed. Ooh, can you pray for me? Yes, Gannon, I will pray for you, of course, but I will uh, I will pray for you for sure. I'm sorry to hear that, buddy. Uh, I will definitely keep you in my prayers. Uh, Ashton says, so the MCQ and the SAQ both have prompts. No, not necessarily. I can guarantee you the MCQ does. Well, that's a good question. I'm going to be honest with you. I can't guarantee on the SAQ. We've got some uh, Byzantine slash Russian writing. I don't, uh, I don't, I can't decipher that. So I do apologize. I'm not that well educated. Sophie B with the picture wars. Okay. Um, can you list 10 key figures from the AP section? I can list 10 key figures from the AP section. Can you is the question. Yeah. I mean, I can go ahead and say Kang Chi. I can say uh, Henry. I could say Magellan. I could say Philip II. I could say Charles V. I could say Pope Leo. 
the 10th, Pope Leo III, Pope Paul III, Pope Paul IV, Ignatius of Loyola. You've got uh, all kinds of figures in there. You've got Shah Abbas. You've got uh, Shah Jahan. You have uh, Hideyoshi Toyotoma, who was a daimyo from Japan. I think I've mentioned about, I, I think that's covered me, but you got to mention 10 and you need to know them very well. Uh, so they are there for the taking. They are in there. All right, let's see. Can you explain the line of demarcation again? Yeah, of course. Picture wars. Oh my, whoa. Picture wars are heating up again. It's hilarious. I don't know who that is. I can't tell, but wow. Uh, we're coming hard with the picture wars here. Okay, can you explain the line of demarcation again? Sure. It's part of the tree. I'm going to take it down though, because that is a, oh man, that's that's mean. I don't know who that is. Uh, the line of demarcation is basically this line that is created by Pope Alexander VI that cuts through Brazil at like 60 degrees west longitude. So anything west of the line, the Pope says, that goes to Spain. Anything east of the line goes to Portugal. Roman, hi, how you doing, bud? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm here. Uh, okay. Let's see, going through my list, we got Brett. Will we have to explain the seven key factors that led to the Spanish conquest or just list? Uh, I'm going to keep it simple for you. You just have to list them, Brett. Yeah, I, I in the past, I've had students explain them. Uh, but for time purposes tomorrow, I'm just going to have you list them because it's going to be a long quiz. So we need to be ready to go right away tomorrow. Ashton, consequences of the Atlantic slave trade. Okay, when you look at consequences of the slave trade, when you think of consequences, don't just think of negative consequences, all right? Make sure that you understand that consequences could be negative, could be positive, okay? There are a lot of negative consequences for the enslaved peoples, the enslaved natives, the enslaved Africans. I think loss of freedom, economic setback, social mobility setback, right? I mean, the state of slavery is really bad. Uh, so that's a huge consequence right there. Okay, you're taken from your homeland. African families are torn apart. Do you know how devastating this was to African civilization? Some of the strong civilizations in Africa lost their best, most fit people. The smartest the strongest, the most able people were taken to the Americas um, and the healthiest people were taken. So unfortunately, the people who survived that didn't get taken, they had a lot to rebuild and they had lost their strongest people. Their most valuable people were taken away from them due to this, this European colonization and this mindset, this superiority mindset. Uh, so that was, that was a problem. That's a major consequence. On the other hand, uh, a lot of European people, English, Spanish, Portuguese, they got really wealthy off of this. I mean, extremely wealthy uh, based on slave trade. So those are some of the consequences there. The AP questions are off the same reading as last time. Yes, unit three, I think it's 140 to 180 or 141 to 181. That is, that's been the same reading. I wasn't really happy with our output on last chapter for the AP. So there you go. We're going to give it a second try. Just this time, this time, some advice. Anything about like the Protestant Reformation or the Renaissance is not going to be on this version. Uh, that was covered already. So you won't really need to focus in on that. Sure. Mercantilism. Gotcha. Mercantilism is a theory that held, that holds or held. Really, it's, it's not in style anymore. It's a theory that held that a country's power is based solely on its wealth. So mercantilist countries, they were trying to gather as much gold, silver, other valuable items as they possibly could. And they wanted to limit what other countries were able to get. So the more land you gobble up, the more areas you colonize, the more colonies that you exploit, the more wealthy you get. Then if you have the resources that, let's say, let's say you're England, if you have the resources that France doesn't have, but France wants it, who are they going to go to get it? They have to go to you. 
So now you're exporting more goods to them than you're buying from them, which makes you more wealthy than them. And that's how you win the competition. Okay. That's called having a favorable balance of trade. Now, that doesn't necessarily work today. I think that exports are still important, uh, but you can see that the United States economy is still up there pretty high, even though we really export um, not very many things. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's a global economy. And there's a lot of different transactions today. Back then, it was like a competition. It was like, who could export more uh, than the import? And then that's going to determine their wealth. That's mercantilism in a nutshell. Working definition of global trade. I think to, to summarize it, uh, Grace, I, I would just say that global trade is where you have trade that spans across continents, across Atlantic Ocean, across Pacific. So it's literally what it, what it says. It's trade that becomes more global due to the better technology on ships, the compass, the Astrolab, all of those different entities that would help you, of course, trade across oceans. I think that's the big key there. Jacob D. Who is that in the picture wars? What is, what are going on? These are not real people in the picture wars. I don't recognize, you must be like distorting the image or something like that. Hernan Cortez is basically the Spanish conquistador responsible for conquering the Aztec. Okay, in 1521. That's really what you need to know. Nope, I'm not going to, not that one I'm not going to do. I, I told you that that's in the reading. I told you to study that. Uh, Dominic, sorry, but I'm not going to uh, give you the answer to who are the gunpowder empires and the different taxation systems. I want to see that you can prove to me that you did the reading and uh, that you're able to gather that. I'm sorry. I, I, you know, I would love to answer, but I just, I want to see, I don't want to give you all the answers. Okay. From the AP part, if it's on the content part, I'll give you the answer, but the AP part, I want that to be a challenge. Who is Metacom? Where is he from? Okay. Metacom is a chief of a tribe called the Wampanoag. I'll spell that for you. W-A-M-P-A-N-O-A-G. That would, that's probably not mentioned in your textbook, you know the name of that tribe, but that's where he's from. He's from the East Coast. Wampanoag were from like the Virginia region up all the way along the East Coast uh, there. And um, he was chief and he led an uprising against the English that was fairly successful until he was actually killed in battle in 1675. Looks like we're losing our numbers here, so I think maybe I was pretty thorough. If you're still here, go ahead and give me a hello in the comments. I'd like to see um, who's in attendance and hanging around. Uh, and, of course, I'm here to answer any questions that you have, so I'll stick around um, for those questions. Once again, this will uh, this will replay um, pretty much as soon as I end the broadcast, if you can find it on my channel. So if you have any other questions, it uh, will be there available for you. Okay, a lot of people checking in. Excellent. It's nice to see all of you. If you have any further questions, I'm here to answer. I'm going to hang out for as long as I need. That's what this is all about. Make sure you get your questions answered. Unless it's <laughs> unless it's like you, you want answers on the AP part. You know, that that one I can't. I don't really want to give away the answers on the AP part. I want to, I want to really assess uh, your comprehension and, and if you did the reading there. I would say, though, Dominic, just because you're hanging out uh, and just because you're here, I would say that, uh, you know, the gunpowder empires are mentioned early on in the reading. Russia, Ottomans, Safavids, Mughals. You know, I mean, those those are some of the big ones. And and really what you need to know is like the, the ones that uh, used guns and used cannons to propagate, of course, their conquest, colonization. That's another part. The different taxation systems, um, you can find them later in the reading toward the end. Um, talks about the Ottoman system, talks about the Aztec system, which was a tribute system. So there you go. I basically answered it for you. I didn't really want to, but um, I did. 
do we need to explain the taxation systems? Uh, my question says to describe. So yeah, you will need to talk about those uh, in in as much detail as you can. So you should know. You should. It's going to be naming it and then also describing it. Love that picture. That's adorable. That's awesome. I really like that picture. Uh, let's see. How many short answers are going to be on the content portion? I've got, I'll tell you exactly, Alexia, four. Four short answers on the content portion. Hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Gannon. Appreciate that. Okay, any other questions that I can answer for you? I am here to answer. Ashton, here we go. Can you explain relationship with the natives? Yes, that is in the notes. That's on your notes there on your review sheet. So you really want to focus on the English versus the French relationships. The French relationship was really good because it was based on the fur trade, right? So they had a really good working relationship because they benefited mutually, okay? <laughs> So one of the things you need to think about is um, the fact that the French were getting the fur pelts, okay, and the Native Americans were getting French goods like metal pots and pans, metal cookware, guns, horse, what have you. So they were mutually benefiting. And also, remember, I taught you that the French were not really here to stay. Um, more so, the French were here to kind of get in, trap the fur, take the fur back to France, sell it. That was it. They really didn't bring women and children. They were here only for the fur trade purposes. That's the really big reason that they came. The English were here to settle and stay. So they posed the bigger threat. They also wanted to uh, Christianize the natives. They saw the natives as heathens and devil worshipers and things of that nature. So they really wanted to uh, remove natives, push them off of land, and that created more cause for conflict. Ashton equals this sign I'm seeing all over the place. I don't quite know what it means, but it seems to be pretty popular. This this P. I think that used to be in like a Super Mario game or like a Super Smash Brothers or one of those things where like you throw it, you jump on it, and then it explodes. That I don't know if that's what that's referring to, but that, that's an old school symbol that, that I've seen before. Um, so it's not really hieroglyphics, but I'm not exactly sure what that P means. But I know it's like really popular right now. And it's all over the place. Okay. Just in case, how many tax systems and gunpowder empires should we know? Tax systems, I'm going to go with two. Gunpowder empires, I'm going to go with four. Okay, so two and four. Alexi, how many questions will be on the AP between MCQ and SAQ? There's going to be one prompt MCQ, which has three multiple choice questions. The SAQ, all SAQs have three parts. So there's like an A, B, and C. So really there's six questions between the two. Not pushing P. Yeah, that's confusing to me. That's like hieroglyphics. That's some type of slang, I would guess. Kind of means something, but I don't know what it means. Um, I hope it's not derogatory. Hope it's not derogatory. That's all I would say. Hopefully, get you guys are not uh, being derogatory. <sighs> Jeez, oh, Pete's, yeah. Okay. I hope it's not derogatory. Is it a button? Maybe it's that old school um, game, like I was saying, like you push the button, but you know, that's Super Mario's long time ago. That was the 80s. That was the 80s now. All right. So, that picture is just killing me. Can you help me understand what Magellan circumnavigated? Sure. The globe. Um, so the earth, he starts in Portugal. How can I, uh, okay, so over here, let me share my screen. Let me show you. All 
All right, we got to go to the textbook. Here's the, first of all, while we're here, here is the page 572. There's the disease column right there. Livestock. These are all things going to the Americas. And then these are all things going back to the old world. So this is 572. It's in your book. You should really study that. All right. Now I need to find my map on your boy Magellan. Oh, by the way, look at this. Talked about the horrors of the Middle Passage. Here's a, a slave who had to, Olida Ekrano, who was very educated, was a great writer. Um, he talked about this trip. Look at how they, look at, these are, these are humans, okay? Look at how they loaded the bottoms of these ships with human beings. Look at this. This is, this is just awful. This is so sad to look at this, to take a look at how Europeans used people and put them in such a bad predicament like this, that they had it all mapped out as to where they had to sleep so that they get more money by how many people they could transfer. A lot of people died along the uh, Middle Passage, by the way. I'm getting there, Sophie. This is a triangular trade system that's in your book. My version is much more simple. So I want you to go with my version. Okay, I'm getting there, I'm getting there, I'm getting there. And where is my map? Here it is. Okay, here we go, Sophie. So if you look at this map, you see, here's Magellan, 1519, okay, in purple, coming down this way. Now, this is still Magellan, okay, this purple going down around South America. So comes down here, comes through this little waterway in, in between it. There's a river that you can traverse right here. Then he goes here in 1519, he's hitting into the Pacific now. When he gets in the Pacific, he makes his way through all those small chains of islands that aren't on this map, uh, but um, maybe are on. Nope, they're not on this map either. But nonetheless, he's over here, and he gets into those smaller chains of islands, and then he dies, but then his crew circumnavigates, makes it through around India, and then up along the coast of Saudi Arabia. And then you can see he comes right here down past the tip of Africa and his crew back three years later, 1522 right here, is this purple line sailing back to Spain. Sailing back to Spain and Portugal. Okay. Right here is where he ends up. In. This is Portugal right here. Okay. Finishes right there. So he circumnavigates the globe, which is the entire earth basically from Spain going west into the Atlantic and then going into the Pacific and then coming back along the coast of India slash Saudi Arabia, then around Africa back to Spain. So that's basically what you're looking at there. Let me know if that answered your question too. I, I hope it did. I tried my best uh, with the maps within the chapter. Oh, there are a lot of... Uh, a lot of questions popped up while I was doing that. Okay, Ashton, you have to explain the gunpowders. Explain the gunpowder empires? Nope, just list. Hmm. For the AP figures, are we allowed to talk about people we've already learned about? Sure. Yeah, if they were in Chapter 17, it doesn't matter. The figures, it uh, doesn't matter. As long as you give me, you know, as long as you give me figures and you know them really well, I'll be happy with that. That's fine. Do we have to just know the empires or explain how they developed? Um, for the gunpowder empires, you just need a list. So you'll be good by just listing there. Who is that in that picture, Sophie? I, that is not like, is this the real Sophie B? I don't, I don't think that's Sophie B. That might be somebody impersonating. That's probably Janda. That's probably Janda impersonating Sophie B. That's what I think. I don't see Janda. He's always on here. He's a mainstay. And I don't see Kirk. I don't see my, uh, these guys are always on here. 
Ashton already answered that one. Dominic, what key places should we know about thoroughly? Uh, Spain. Well, I mean, all the ones that are on your review sheet for sure. Yeah, I think you should know all the ones that are on your review sheet. And like I said earlier, you, you really need to be able to you really need to be able to kind of talk about how they relate. You really need to know how they relate to the subject matter of this chapter. Gabby G. How many AP key figures do we list and explain again? I'm going to ask you to have at least five. You got to know at least five. I saw, I got you. You're all right. You're all right, Gabby G. I, I, I figured it out. Okay. All right. Any other key questions that I can help with? Any other key questions? Pretty good session. Pretty good session. We made it through a lot of information. That was a good review. I'm, I'm pretty happy about that. I really enjoy doing this. It's a lot of work because I, I put in my little things, you know, and I got to set up there's a lot to set up, like the videos and the commercials and stuff like that. But it's fun for me. It's uh, it's kind of a uh, enjoy enjoyment. I look forward to doing it. I don't see any questions in the last like 20 seconds, so I'm going to go to my final advice. Okay, final advice. Here's what I want to say. Uh, first of all, for the final advice, I think that the opportunity is there for you on the content part. Like I'm really expecting some high scores, some quality scores on the content. I think I was pretty thorough tonight and throughout the week telling you what you really need to know. Um, so I'm really looking for high scores, high scores, 15 plus, 16 plus needs to be the average, right? Uh, anything better than that would be a good bonus. However, on the on the juxtaposition or the opposite side, the polar opposite side, the AP is going to be a challenge. The AP, I think, um, for those who are on here with me, that might not be as hard because I kind of gave you a lot of clues. Uh, but the AP is going to be challenging because there's a lot to know there. And uh, you, you really have had to, you, you had to have do the, done the reading. You, you, if you didn't do the reading, then, the, then I don't know what's going to happen. You know, that's the key. Doing the reading is the key. Um, but uh, that's going to be the challenge that I'm looking forward to see how you rise to the occasion with uh, tomorrow. And then before I leave you, remember, thank you for being such kind and devoted students. I truly appreciate all of your efforts and I wish you a great success and luck tomorrow. Uh, remember to keep all of our classmates in your prayers. And of course, remember to say thank you to your parents. They do a lot for you. And um, I think that's one of the most important things that you can do. All right. Have a wonderful night and we will see you tomorrow. Did we have section four notes, Parker? Yep. I posted them on the bulletin board it's a slideshow basically um, on the bulletin board that you can go to week two scroll down it'll say chapter 20 slideshow section four you should be able to grab those and that's what you missed all right thanks everyone have a wonderful night i'll stay on here for about another minute and see what we've got Three pointers that the final key ballers in the live can have. Uh, sure, there's going to be a chart on the key figures. You're going to have to name a key figure. You're going to have to talk about what country they were from. And you got to explain something that they did or accomplished. So that's what you're looking at as far as like the depth of what you'll really need to know about those key figures. Okay, I got about 30 more seconds. We've been on for an hour and a hour and five minutes. I think this is our longest one yet. So I'm pretty I'm pretty excited about that. But I know we missed review day, so all right. Okay. Hey, have a wonderful night. Get some sleep. Say thank you to your parents. Say your prayers. And uh we'll see you back at it tomorrow. Good luck.